begin promptly. Uh, we will be recording this session today, so I hope that's okay with everyone. Uh, but thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, my name is Jamie Hart. I am uh, the Survivor Outreach Coordinator here at Brave Step. Uh, we, are, we thank you guys so much for coming to this Changemaker Workshop. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Brave Step, we are a nonprofit organization that empowers uh, those who have been impacted by sexual violence, and that includes survivors, loved ones, friends, coworkers, and advocates. Um, our Changemaker program is kind of how we um, advocate and educate um, in order to um, gain the tools that we need to ultimately help to prevent um, future sexual violence. So that's one of the reasons why we, we are here tonight. Um, and we're just so thankful to have this opportunity to educate ourselves and each other uh, so that we can hopefully prevent things like this from happening to the people that we love. Um, before we get started, we have a few housekeeping details. Um, throughout the conversation, we're going to keep everyone muted except for our speaker tonight. Um, some things that we will discuss might be alarming, disturbing, triggering, particularly if you've experienced um, any sort of sexual violence yourself. Uh, so please take care of yourself and do what you need in order to exercise self-care. If you need to step away and come back, that is totally fine. Take some deep breaths. Or if you need some support, you can feel free to um, private message me or Chris Crystal um, at Brave Step. Um, as Simon, our speaker, is going to be presenting, feel free to ask any questions that you have in the chat um, to the right of your screen, and we will try to select as many of those questions as we can as time allows at the end. So let's get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Simon Arkley. He is the president and CEO of the Lantern Project. Simon Arkley and his wife, Aletha, have been involved in the fight against trafficking for over a decade and have served in many areas from education, direct assistance, aftercare, and safe house development and management. They've created training materials for multiple public spheres and continue to speak and educate on the issue of trafficking every opportunity they get. They founded the Lantern Project in 2020 and have already educated thousands with in-person and video training such as this one, engaged more than 100 local organizations to commit to fight against trafficking, assisted dozens of survivors of trafficking and sexual exploitation, and currently operate two safe houses for survivors of trafficking. Their vision is to see trafficking completely eradicated, um, and they're starting here in the Charlotte area. So we're grateful for his time and his expertise. Thank you so much for being here, Simon. I will turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's so great to be on with all of you. And it's so exciting for me to see uh, so many names popping up, asking to be admitted. Uh, a training I did yesterday had four people. And I was just telling Crystal, that's okay for me because all it takes is for us to get the right information into one parent's hands. And then that's that's good enough for me. And so seeing so many of you is honestly, you know, it's amazing. Um, so a little, you know, it kind of just encapsulate a little bit more about who we are. Um, so we are a counter trafficking agency based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I do have a weird accent. I was born and raised in the UK. So we'll just address that right away because I will say the word can't quite a bit and that usually gets a response. Um, so I was born and raised in the UK. Um, I moved here a little over 20 years ago. Um, I came over to go to school on day one. I met my wife and that was it. I've been here ever since. Um, absolutely love the United States. I'm an American citizen now. We work passionately um, to protect um, the people of the United States. Uh, we have been around since 2020 as an agency, but like I said, my wife and I have been doing this for over 12 years now. Um, we actually started it in Europe. Um, that's where we were first exposed to sex trafficking. And uh, we just realized when we came back to the U.S., it was just growing so quickly over here. Uh, we just felt we had to do something. So we stepped into it um, quite a, quite unknowingly, um, just how how um, how widespread it was and how bad it was getting and that even 12 years ago. Um, and so in those in the years that we've been doing this, we've been part of hundreds of cases 
Um, we have, uh, you know, cases as young as three years old, as old as 48 when it comes to trafficking. Um, you know, so um, as Jamie mentioned, you know, you know, we won't talk about details per se, but, you know, this is something that could, you know, evoke a response in you. So, you know, it, it definitely take time for yourself, you know, and, and step away if you need to as we go over this. But the Lantern Project is, is a relatively small agency for what we do. People think we're a lot bigger. We're just highly effective. And the reason for that is that we have been passionate about this for a long time. And we've been building the infrastructure that we needed for many, many years. Um, uh, as Jamie mentioned, we have two safe houses right now. We're actually about to open our own street. Uh, and I didn't mention that in the bio, I should have, but in about three weeks, we we're opening our own street for survivors, long-term transitional. Um, so we are going to be able to have four houses up and running simultaneously for survivors of sex trafficking. So, and we, we function in three main ways. Uh, we function in prevention victim identification, and then restoration. So the prevention element, obviously we talk to schools, businesses, NGOs, nonprofits, churches, essentially anyone that will listen to us about the digital dangers in particular, and about how predators are using organizations as fronts and how to protect your children, software, hardware, things like that. Um, we're really into the school system right now and just trying to get into these kids' lives while they're young enough so that we don't see them on the streets and they don't end up need, needing to be in our safe houses. Um, so the prevention element is key for what we do. Um, I'm a tech nerd by background. I'm a web guy. Um, so I love delving into technology, talking to kids about technology, talking about the dangers. And I see many of you talking about the apps that we'll hit on uh, tonight in the chat. Um, that's a huge part of what we do. We are also part of local task forces. So we work to identify current victims of trafficking. Uh, we do that through sting operations. We do that through training storefronts and organizations in high uh, you know, potential areas to recognize and report. And then we obviously the restoration element is our safe house network. Um, so you know our safe houses are dotted all around the region. Uh, one of them is fully staffed. Um, it's a little bit more of an emergent <clears throat> situation. And then the others are uh, transitional houses for those that have gotten out and are survivors. So as I go through the presentation tonight, please, please keep any questions in your head or write them in the chat, because it's vitally important that you take this information and you personalize it, because otherwise it's just general information, right? But if you have children in particular or grandchildren and you're just like, I want to know how to keep them safe or I want to know how to keep myself safe, my sisters, my brothers, um, any of that, please, please, you know, I want you guys to ask questions. Um, the, the presentation is very broad and that's intentional because as we get into the issue of trafficking and sexual exploitation, you know, we have a very natural defense mechanism where when we hear this kind of content, that we start to shield ourselves from it. And I don't want to overload you with data and statistics per se. I just want you guys to know what trafficking looks like, um, what trafficking looks like in the in the U.S. and in in our towns and cities, and then boil that down to how what that looks like in our homes and how we keep our uh, how we keep our families safe. So um, definitely, you know, want you guys to be interactive as we're going through this, and then we'll have a time of question and answers at the end where we'll kind of go into more of the the specifics. Um, so um, my uh, my monitors are being a little bit quirky right now, but I'm going to go ahead and share. Can everyone see that okay? Just a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. So if you do one thing, just write down my email address right there, the info at the Lantern email address or screenshot that or something, because our goal again is to personalize this information for you guys. If you have any questions that we don't get to, please, please reach out. Um, we're very happy to talk about this issue with anyone. So, um, all right, hold on one sec. There we go. So, you know, broad Google view, what is trafficking? So the legal definition is the one that we have to say, essentially, unlawful act of transporting or coercing people in order to benefit from their work or service, typically in the form of forced labor or sexual exploitation. So I always like to talk about all of the forms of trafficking, although we specialize in, in sex trafficking. Um, there are two other huge forms of trafficking. 
Um, we have labor trafficking, which I'm sure you, you've heard of, which is primarily, um, you know, obviously people being uh, forced labor. We had a case here in Charlotte of, of um, a, you know, a forced uh, nanny situation where a young lady was being forced to nanny for an affluent family. Uh, we've also had some southern border cases where, um, you know, young women have been forced to work in uh, retail uh, establishments. Um, and those were com those were entirely labor trafficking. Um, and then obviously, you know, we have sex trafficking. And the other one, which people don't really know about is organ trafficking. We hit on that only because it's very disturbing and it's on the increase, but that is where people are literally harvested for their organs. It's a very horrific situation, but that is on the rise as well. So I like to at least mention those, even though we concentrate on uh, sex trafficking. So trafficking is modern day slavery. There is no... There is no qualms about that definition. Um, you know, there's a very famous quote that says slavery was never truly abolished. It just got a facelift. And that's kind of what we see right now is there are more people enslaved globally right now than at any other point in human history. And that's alarming, but that's the reality. That's what the data shows. Um, so we're going to go over some, st some stats. We're going to talk about this a little bit, but again, you know, um, if you feel like you're getting overwhelmed, you feel like it's becoming too much, you can obviously step away. But so estimates say that internationally, only about 0.04% of survivors of human trafficking cases are ever identified. So the data that we're dealing with is very scattered. It's very dispersed. One of the reasons that this is so difficult of a work is because trafficking is very rarely reported accurately. It's either uh, misreported, misdiagnosed, or, you know, victims don't self-identify or, you know, they just don't come forward at all because of fear or whatever. And that's, that's a huge part. So what we do know is, you know, we'll go into how many people are currently being trafficked globally, but we know that of the hundreds of thousands alone that are being trafficked within the United States, only 0.04% of them are ever identified. Um, so less than half of a percent, uh, which is really, really scary. Um, and that's one of the reasons why these education you know, uh, sessions are so important. Because if we can just give you that little bit of information that lets you recognize something is off and you can report that, that could potentially mean someone getting rescued. So more than 25 people, million people are trafficked every single year. And so current global estimates, I think I have it on here, but I mean, they, they fluctuate anyway, between, anywhere between 50 and 60 million people are currently trafficked globally. But the, the, the stark reality is that one in four victims are children. And these numbers are staggering and they're increasing exponentially. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, one of the things that I wanted to mention, um, you know, as a lot of you are mentioning the social media platforms that your your children are on, is that, you know, trafficking, especially, you know, digital trafficking, there are two main things that have influenced trafficking that are very visible from the data when you step back and take a look at it. The first one is the release of the iPhone. Trafficking spiked significantly with the release of the iPhone. Um, and the other one is COVID-19. Huge spikes during, and, and, and there's reasons for both of those. Obviously the iPhone, we were essentially carrying around the internet in our pocket. And that became, that allowed people to get access to, to more content, but it also allowed more predators to access people. And it was kind of, it was an unknown thing for a long time, but every device that you have is a two-way door. It's not just, you know, you getting on an iPad or your kid getting on an iPad and accessing Roblox, Minecraft, or whatever. It is the people on the other side of that gain and access to your kids as well. That's a very important, you know, uh, distinction that we have to remember. But the other, you know, we when we talk about COVID-19, we're still dealing with the fallout of COVID-19. Um, Facebook alone saw a 125% increase in trafficking from the year 19, nine, uh, 2019 through to 2020, to the end of 2020. So the beginning of COVID saw a 125% increase in trafficking because everyone was online. And that was our kids and the predators at the same time. So every our world is changing pretty quickly. Um, and so it's really important that we're cognizant of the fact that, you know, the internet now 
plays a massive role in everything when it comes to um, trafficking. So, um, so 88% now of sex trafficking cases are internet based. So that's a, I mean, and that's, that's kind of a given now. Um, it used to be very different, even, you know, uh, when we started this, it was still very much a, um, you know, we used to do a lot of work in the local strip clubs with the young ladies. We would do a lot of work on the strip, uh, you know, with young, young women who were prostituting themselves and ultimately being controlled by pimps or traffickers. And that was where a lot of our work had to be. That was, you know, backpage.com was a big hub. You know, we would work in in uh, in unison with law enforcement for stings on on things like Backpage and Craigslist and things like that. But we're at the point right now where almost all of these cases are originating online, and that's uh you know that's something we have to be aware of. So, child sex trafficking has been reported in all fifty states, um, and that's again it's alarming to some people. But everywhere now has cases of sex trafficking. Uh, we can't really avoid it. Uh, big city, small town, it's it's happening everywhere. We personally, you know, in, in the greater Charlotte area, we've seen and helped close down residential brothels that are just popping up in the middle of your average neighborhood. Um, it's happening everywhere. And then the reason is it's a it's a very it's a low bar of entry as far as a crime. Um, it's a crime of opportunity. And it really is a matter of supply and demand. So if there is enough demand for a product, people will be willing to supply it. And commercial sex and unfortunately minors is in huge demand and people are willing to supply it. And so now we're at the point where all 50 states have had cases and the majority of towns now are, are seeing this happen on a regular basis. So... When I talk about the data being fragmented, this is one of the this is one of the instances. So most of our data comes from the what's called the TIP report, which is the trafficking in persons report that's assembled by the Justice Department. But the reality is, is we just our data is so fragmented. So a lot of what we speak from, I try to use their data for stats, but then I'll give you my opinion as someone who's been doing this for so long. Um, you know, best estimates are between 10,000 and 300,000 American kids are uh, victimized each year through sexual exploitation. Now, that is obviously a massive gap between 10,000 and 300,000. Um, the reality is, is that the reporting for this is so fragmented. Children are not reporting this, obviously, for the most part. Um, and so it's a, it's just a our data is so fragmented, but in my estimates, with the amount of increase I've seen over the last decade, I would say the numbers are probably actually higher than that, significantly higher. That that tip report statistic is from 2019. Again, that's pre-COVID, and and so in my estimations, that number is probably a lot higher. And us, you know, as Americans, this this is this should be heartbreaking for us when we look at these statistics, because these are our children, our neighbor's children. These are kids who are going to school with our kids. And it really is now everywhere. And it's invaded every aspect of society. And it's it's gut-wrenching. Um, but the reality is, is that this is what we're dealing with right now. So average age a teen enters the sex trade in the United States is now between 12 and 14 years old. So that statistic is a lot younger for boys. So that's actually the statistic for female. Um, so for boys entering, entering the trade, it's usually now between nine and 11 years old, um, which is, you know, and that's an issue that we'll talk a little bit more about later. So in all of this, the hundreds of thousands of potential victims all across the United States, we only have 1,500 beds allocated to survivors of sex trafficking. So an agency like ours, when we get a call either from FBI, law enforcement, another agency that says, hey, we think we have a trafficking survivor, you know, when they do hotel stings or prostitution stings, an agency like ours has to try to figure out where to put these people in order to help them and how to serve them. And it is literally a moving target because, you know, most of our clients that we serve in our safe houses have their children with them. So as soon as we take in a survivor with their, with their children, that house is then closed to anyone else, obviously, to protect the children. So the reality is, is that this is this is what we're up against still. 
in this day and age, we're still up against a huge sort shortfall and we're constantly juggling between the agencies trying to help all of these survivors. And that's one of our visions is to build our network, is to build our these little pop-up mini streets that we're doing right now that can house these survivors and help them on their journey of restoration. So I'm going to talk really quickly before we get into the tech element, because I know that's going to be a huge part of what you guys need to know about the indicators of trafficking. Now, again, these come from Polaris, which those are the guys who run the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, you know, and I'll make sure you guys have that information. But indicators of trafficking, you know, I get they vary greatly. But what what I want you guys to realize is trafficking is not so. OK, so when I was growing up, many of you may be the same. You know, my mom was always like, hey, if someone pulls up in a white van and offers you, you know, candy, like, don't go in, you know, that's a that's the bad guy. OK, and that's and that's fair enough. I grew up my whole life afraid of white vans. OK, so and I'm sure many of you are the same. You know, it's just like my wife said was for her, it was the white van with puppies. For me, I didn't care about dogs. So for me, it was candy, um, you know, and that's the thing is like that's what we were taught growing up. But what trafficking looks like now is very different. The white van kidnapping thing really doesn't happen in the U.S. It's exceptionally rare. What's going to happen is that someone is going to be groomed through social media, through some kind of digital platform, either or through a familial relationship. And then they're going to actually be trafficked many times for, while they're still living at home. Um, and then that will then lead to them being, you know, moved onto a trafficking circuit or something. So when we talk about indicators, they vary greatly. But, um, you know, I was talking to my wife about this and I was like, you know what, when I look at a lot of these indicators, I have a 14 year old. I'm like, how do I tell whether he's just being 14 <laughs> or something is going on? So you have to kind of, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But um, does the person appear disconnected from family, friends, community organizations, or houses of worship? One of the main things that we've noticed over the years, and I'll, I'll boil all this down to the few that I think are the most important. Significant changes in demeanor are a big thing to be looking out for. So if your child went from being very outgoing and friendly, and all of a sudden they're very withdrawn and they're they're shy, they don't want to hang out with friends, they don't want to go to the same places, you know, that's that's usually a pretty big indicator. Um, another one of the big indicators is if they all of a sudden have, you know, a second phone or they start receiving gifts. Um, that's a big indicator that something has changed because traffickers will often send them burner phones, other ways for them to communicate that aren't being monitored by parents. Um, and then, you know, changes in the way that they're dressing and then, you know, dropping in grades or things like that are also big indicators that something is going on in your child's life that you need to stop and have this conversation. Um, so when we do street work, when we go out and we look on the streets, a lot of these that we look for is, is the person disoriented, confused, or showing signs of mental or physical abuse. So we had a case, um, you know, late last year um, where a the survivor you know, was very, it was very obvious to us what she was going through because we saw significant um, external factors on her body that let us know, okay, she's going through some severe physical abuse. Um, and so, you know, it does look different when it comes to your kids versus the people that you might encounter on the street, but it's still good that you know this stuff and we can make this presentation available um, to all of you. But um, overly fearful or submissive um, is one of the ones to look for if they don't make eye contact or someone else is speaking for them. You know, we have a very large mall here. Um, you know, it's basically one of the, I guess, one of the East Coast, like main tourist attractions here in Charlotte area. Um, and, you know, we do patrols checking for people. And one of the reasons that Charlotte has its new, you know, anti-trafficking task force is because out of that mall, were some very severe trafficking cases of minor females and they were exhibiting all of these signs and they were able to be identified you know they were surrounded by men they were looked fearful they looked submissive they 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 you know as we unpack the story we find out they'd just been very severely threatened um, and we were able in those cases law enforcement was able to rescue those young girls 
but because of that, you know, legislation was actually changed in our region because of it. So, um, living in unsuitable living uh, living conditions, lack of personal possessions. We're trying really hard to get, and I don't know, you know, I know a lot of you are from Texas. Um, I don't know what the law is there, but you know, in Florida, it's mandated that all hotel workers, no matter who they are that they take a counter-trafficking training on how to identify trafficking and report it correctly. That is not the case right now in North Carolina. So we're actually working with the, the state les legislature to, to actually get that you know, written into law that all hoteliers are actually trained on how to identify because that's where a lot of this is gonna come up when a young woman doesn't know what state she's in and she doesn't know where she is and she doesn't have personal possessions. Um, so again, so that's just kind of a crash course. We're going to talk about tech and trafficking right now. Um, this is where, um, whoops, sorry. This is where a lot of you are going to freak out. This is where a lot of people are going to feel overwhelmed. The one thing that we hear the most from moms is that I don't understand the technology. My child knows more than I do. I'm not tech savvy. I don't know how to keep them safe. And and one of the main reasons, one of the main ways we do this, or the reasons we do it the way that we do it is to kind of help overcome that so that you guys can keep your kids safe and we, we, we make it as easy as humanly possible. So the Center for Missing and Exploited Children, um, their most recent data says right now it takes about eight minutes for a predator to form a lasting bond with your child. And that even shocked me when that came out. I, I I have get to pour over transcripts of, you know, grooming and stuff taking place online. And eight minutes was shocking even for me. But what the data is showing is that right now our lives are so online, out there for the world to see, that before a predator even interacts with their prey, They've learned everything they need to know about them to create that bond. And so, um, you know, I used to do this thing when I would speak, you know, I would I would have the organizer give me the name of someone and then I would I would just do a, a high level scrape of their data so I could freak them out. Um, my wife told me that it was super creepy that I did that. So I stopped doing it. <laughs> but the reality is, is that our lives are all online for everyone to see. So, you know, what we're seeing is predators are literally just going and checking, you know, a kid's TikTok account and they're finding out what school they go to, what their hobbies are, their siblings names, their pets names. So before they interact with them, they already have all of this information and it's becoming increasingly easy for them to then create that lasting bond with um, the children. So. The latest online predator stats of 23 show that uh, half a million predators are a daily threat to kids on the internet. Uh, children aged 12 to 15 are the main target. So, there, but there are an estimate of 5 million active predators on the internet right now. So that's, you know, anyone exhibiting predatory behavior online, it's estimated there are about 5 million at any given point. So, you know, Half of the world falls asleep, the other half wakes up, and then their predators get online. So we are absolutely in the wild west of internet days. So it's really, really important that we're engaging in this fight and we're talking to our kids and our families. And, and when I say kids, I mean, that means grandkids too. We have so many grandparents reaching out to us right now, asking how to protect their grandkids because their grandkids are showing up at their houses with an iPad and that's they're sitting on that iPad for hours. And these grandparents are like, I don't know who they're talking to. I don't know what apps they're on. I don't know how to protect them. And there is a huge wave right now of, of, of the older generation trying to protect their kids and their grandkids and their great grandkids from tech issues. So again, we're trying to lower the bar and make that a little bit easier for everyone. So Estimated 82% of child sex crimes start with a social media account. So delay social media as long as humanly possible. And I know that that is hard. And, you know, 
the, one of the main things I hear from parents is my kids feel like they are, you know, they don't fit in because all their friends have TikTok. My kids feel like they don't fit in because all their friends have Snapchat and Instagram. And I get that and I do. But the reality is the dangers right now of social media are so significant that the character development of our kids and allowing them to be a little bit different is so worth it for them. Even though it's hard and even though you're going to have to navigate tantrums and you're going to have to navigate talking through this with the children, delaying social media as long as humanly possible is a huge way to keep your kids safe. So there's there's legislation in some states right now that are making it illegal for anyone younger than 14 to be on social media. And if they want to be on social media at 16, they need parental consent. Now, again, that sounds like something that might be a little bit strict for some people. As someone who deals with this on a daily basis, I am like, absolutely 100%, let's do it. Because your average age now of a kid getting an iPhone is about nine years old. Um, and from there, they're on social media. And it, a lot of the time, it's unrestricted. Parents don't know how to secure these accounts. And these children are being, um, they are accessing horrific content and being accessed. And I'm going to give you some resources from our website and just some stuff that I really recommend that you watch um, on your own time. And, and one of those videos in particular is about a, it's a, a young woman who runs an agency and she essentially, you know, opens up an unsecured Instagram account as a 12 year old girl. And literally within one minute, she's getting um, illicit photography sent to her. She's getting requests for video chat. She's getting just filth and smut sent to her through her private messages and this is what this is what the internet is right now. It is absolutely terrifying. So, um, delaying social media is one of those things where it's hard. It's very hard, but you will never, at the end of your life, hear your kids say, "Man, I really wish I had more time on Snapchat." What they're gonna say is, "Man, I really enjoyed my time with my parents." And and one of the ways that we do the empowered parenting is like, look, don't just take away all technology and then force your kid to be Amish and sit in the corner with a piece of wood, right? No, you create alternatives. You do the family time. You do the board games. You you know you go out for a walk. You teach them. You you replace it with other things. So I'm and and many of you maybe too. I'm that generation that kind of straddles. So I grew up with, you know playing outside, you know, I actually touched grass as a child, which, you know, I tell my son all the time, go outside, touch grass. Like, that's all I have to say. And he's like, okay, he knows no technology. I got to go outside. But, you know, the, the internet started beginning, you know, getting really big when I was, um, you know, maybe like 10 or 11 years old. So I kind of straddled that fence. So I remember what it was like before. And I don't have any regrets for climbing trees, right? Or, and, and your kids won't either, even though in the, in the beginning stage, you're going to get a lot of pushback. So I'm just, I, that's the disclaimer. I don't want you to think that I ever say that that will be easy because I know it's not. Um, so in 2019, 70 million child sexual abuse case files were reviewed by the National Center for Missing Exploited Children. Um, that number has only gone up um, every year. It, we have yet to see that number even stall. Um, we don't have, like I said, we don't have a lot of data from post-COVID, um, but if you can imagine if that was 2019 pre-COVID, we know that trafficking through social media went up 125% from 2019 to 2020. You can imagine what that number is going to be like. So I'm going to walk you through some resources. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about... Um, the education and the tools. I'm going to take you to our website. All of that, all of our stuff is free for you to download, free for you to access. Um, but I know that's a lot of information. I know that's a lot of data. I know this, that can be something that induces fear in people. That's never our intent, but also, you know, the reality is jarring and we don't want to sugarcoat what we deal with on any, you know, given day. We want people to understand that you know, the world out there is pretty crazy and it's this is not slowing down. So um, prevention and, um, 
you know, I'm not even, I'm not actually going to even talk about that. I'm going to go over that on my, on the website right now, but make sure you have our website and the, our email written down. Um, but we need to, we need to kind of go over what this looks like and what tools you can access for your kids. So, so this is our website. Um, we're a 501c3. Um, like I said, we've been around for a while, but you can go here. It's just the lantern.net. Um, we would love every, especially if you have kids who are on technology, we would love everyone to just check out the resources for yourself if you need to. Um, right here on the resources tab are going to be the tools that we're going to recommend. So we always tell everyone have the National Human Trafficking Hotline number saved in your phone just in case you see something. Um, they can, I think they can speak like 45 languages on there. So everyone can access this. They are the national uh, reporter for all of this, for all trafficking stuff. But on here we have learning more about the hotline, what to expect when you call. So you can go all of, over all of that. But he, these are the things I wanted to touch base with you guys. So learning the warning signs, online safety and, and tech tools. So. My children, as an example, you know, they're like any other kids. They're 10 and 14. Um, they want to play video games. They want to be online. And again, I'm not going to force my kid away from technology completely because then they would obviously be at a disadvantage in this world. And so, you know, again, I'm a nerd. So my kids are nerds <laughs> by default. Um, so I, I teach them technology, but I do it within con controlled environments. So I teach them coding or I, I let them go through um, graphic design training. And I, you know, and, and so they're online, but when they're online, they're using it as a tool. It's not just a way for them to switch off for hours at a time. And so these are, that's, that's what I'm encouraging all of you. Don't, don't feel like you have to you know, shoot your router and then, you know, and like I said, you know, revert back to dark ages, you know, although, I mean, I wouldn't, if you shut off your router and shut off your internet, that's, that's the best way to protect your kids from online dangers. Right. So, um, so online safety is a big thing. Um, right here on our site, we have how to secure every device that you will need. And this is where I want you guys to, recognize it, you're, a lot of your kids are going to have Chromebooks now because schools send home Chromebooks. Um, you know, we have everything, PlayStation 5s, Xbox, Roku, all of that stuff. These, This is a way for you to secure each of those devices. So the reality is, is that they are going to be on these devices. We know it. Each of these devices is a two-way door. And that's in just, again, I mentioned that, but just remember that if your kids are online, and they're out there on the web, they are accessible for the most part. And so there, and the reality is, is that, you know, we have so many cases now coming through that are related to children's games like Roblox and Minecraft, you know, actually being used as trafficking tools because they have the capacity to interact with each other, interact with strangers. And so go through here, um, learn how to secure all of your devices. Um, strongly recommend that you you know control this at the router level and i know that's a lot of that's one of those words that as soon as you say route a lot of people are just like i have no idea how to use my router you know it's very easy um we actually um on our other page i'll show you we work with a company that actually provides routers that block illicit content from ever reaching your devices they block it at the router level and so the technology is there for the good guys as well, but the bad guys are just using technology a lot more. So you can do this. So Bark is one of the, the, the leaders now in technology when it comes to keeping uh, young people safe online. Uh, Bark, you know, we're trying to get Bark really to put into a lot more situations, we're trying to get parents to use this a lot more. So Bark works in two different ways. Um, there is an app. You can put that app on every device in your home pretty much. Um, and you have a parental login and that's kind of like your master. And it will it will essentially report to you everything that's happening on that device. So we actually use the, the we don't use the Gab phone anymore because Bark released a phone. Um, and literally everything that happens on there 
you will get reported to. You can stop them from deleting text messages. You'll get access for anything regarding cyberbullying, um, eating disorders, um, you know, violent content, sexual content, anything. It's very cheap. Um, if you're in the, if you're thinking that you're about to get your children a device, a smartphone, get them the Bark phone. 100 it is cheaper it's on an android so it doesn't it doesn't look like you know it's not going to make the kids feel embarrassed to have it you know i tell my son all the time like you're fortunate when i was a kid my first phone was like a nokia fridge you know as you're just carrying around this giant thing it weighed like 30 pounds um you know it looks good but it also is completely secure. You can lock down everything. You can only, they can only add people as you let them. Bark are doing amazing things in this space. So that's what we recommend for the, for new phones and for software in particular. Um, we do have an app in the app store. All of our information is on there, but um, for the sake of time, we'll jump around a little bit. Um, I just want you guys to be familiar with the kind of stuff that we're able to help you guys with. Um, that's not where I want it to be. We do, we have conversation starters online and that's a big thing because a lot of parents don't know how to talk about online bullying. They don't know how to talk about digital safety. They don't know how to talk about the issue of sexual content in minors, which is on the increase. Um, I mean, it's heartbreaking right now. How many minors are sharing illicit imagery? And, and the result of that is, you know, it is heartbreaking because these young people are being, those images are then being sold on the dark web for the most part. And these young people are being exploited on a daily basis. So beginning these conversations about social media versus reality, online bullying, time online, uh, truth versus tricksters, and then the pornography issue, sending naked images, all of that is on our website for you guys to access. Find a way to talk to your kids about this stuff. Again, the, the sooner you start to educate young people about this, and this is why we're going into schools right now, and we're and we're you know we have a very uh, simple curriculum for minors that we talk about this stuff because obviously we don't want to make them fearful or give them graphic content, but we want them to know that the internet is not full of a place full of people that you can trust. That there are some people online who are not who they say they are. And that your mom and dad or your parent or your guardian, they're the ones who should be able to tell who's who. And so we kind of talk about kids about sharing that with um, with their families. So, so right here on the bottom of the resource page, again, Bark. Um, another app that we're recommending is Bright Canary. Um, that will, if your kid is on Google, like Gmail, they have a Gmail account, which most kids now do for school. Bright Canary is fantastic. So it will it will connect to your kid's Gmail account. It will also connect to TikTok and uh, Instagram, things like that. And it will literally report everything for you and it will send you concerning content, which is really good. So, you know, if, if they're sending emails and there's concerning content, Bright Canary will alert you. Um, it's very, very good. Uh, it's a brand relatively new piece of software and I'm absolutely in love with it. Um, Canopy is the same. It's relatively new. That will be, that's used to block illicit imagery, even on ads that would pop up. Um, this is what we tell people, you know, who are struggling with pornography or things like that. We tell them to use Canopy because it will block imagery. And then the Griffin router is the router I was talking about that will actually block content from entering your home. Um, so when your child's switch connects to the Wi-Fi, Griffin will literally ask you, is this an adult or is this a child? When you check child, then that child would no, will not be able to access any mature content from that device that is connected to the Wi-Fi. Uh, it's a great piece of technology, and it's another one um, that we recommend. Um, another thing we have on here is um, our family tech contracts. So... Um, it sounds a little extreme to have a tech contract, um, but honestly, this works. This works when kids, when you show them, you know, I take your safety very seriously, therefore we have a contract. You know, so when my son got his uh, PlayStation, we had a contract and the contract has parameters that he must adhere to. 
And if he deviates from that or breaks the rules, the PlayStation goes away for an allotted period of time. So there's consequences. So what we're not just, you know, sometimes when we do these talks, my wife are like, you make us sound like monsters, you know, like we're just like, ah, you know, no technology, you know, you're you're going to sit at home and twiddle your thumbs. No, we have tons of fun, but we because of the nature of my work, I know how dangerous a lot of this can be. So tech contracts are a great way to engage young people. Um, and talk to them about online safety and talk to them about how to remain safe and what happens when technology is used incorrectly. So we have all of this on our website. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out is we do have video trainings. You know, Because this is kind of a little bit of a whirlwind, um, you can actually log in and take these trainings. Um, they're uh, comprehensive counter-trafficking training. Uh, they're not super long and they do have they have like quizzes to help you remember it. You can log in at any point um, and take those trainings. And I think it's something that we, you know, we're we're happy to make available to people. Um, and so, you know, all of this, again, it's a fire hydrant of information. It's a little bit overwhelming for a lot of people. But the reality is, is that, you know, this is happening in the world. I don't want to make you fearful to go online. I don't want your kids to be fearful, but I want you to know that. It is the Wild West out there, but there are the right tools and the right people to help you. And we're one of those people, one, one of those groups of people. You can reach out to us at any point um, and just say, hey, you know, how do I whatever? Or my kid is doing this. My kid is doing that. How do I what? How do I report it? You know, who do I talk to? And we can we can guide you in any way. And um, please take a moment to look over our site as you're able. And then, you know, I want to. I want to definitely move over to um, Crystal if you want to help. I want to move over to any questions because I want to make sure that we are um, we have plenty of time for those because um, you know I yes. want to make sure that. Yeah, thank you so much for all of that information. Um, it can be a lot. Um, I'm a single mom of four, so I'm sitting here thinking about all of my kids that are preteen yeah. to teenage ages, and it just makes you want to throw out all the devices in your home. <laughs> um, yeah. But thank you for teaching us how to do that in a way where we don't have to throw out all our devices, um, just, you know, to exercise some good judgment and use some of the resources that are available to us. Yeah. So um, if you guys um, have any questions or comments, um, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask them out loud. Or if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. I did see um, a couple comments earlier about um, programs that some of our um, our viewers have used, like Verizon Smart Family and Google Family mm -hmm. Link. What would you say about programs like that? Yeah, they're they're absolutely great. I I recommend so. When we talk about technology, we have to remember that the people who create this technology, they're not our friends, you know, and they're not necessarily designing this technology so that it's going to be safe for everyone. Um, you know, Apple has, you know, I'm an Apple guy because I'm a, I'm a web builder and graphic designer by trade. So I love Apple, but Apple products are not designed to really be secure. They're designed to be secure, um, you know, from outside access. But when a child is on there, you're not really able to limit everything properly. So what I say is layer everything. So if you use like, uh, you know, some you know, like the Verizon products or you use the, you know, the um, the circle products or things like that, layer it, um, have have other apps on there, have an app like Bark on top of what you already have. Now, I will say if you're going to put Bark on your kid's phone, it has to be it has to be, you know, a conversation. Um what doesn't go well is your kid pulls their phone up one day and then there's 15 new apps on there monitoring everything. You know, it has to be a conversation. They have to know that this is for the this is for their protection. This is for their betterment, that you love them, that you're with them and you're a team in this. And that's, again, one of the things that we always encourage. You're a team when it comes to safety. Right. So so I would say do it all, any and all, um, you know, as, as much as you can cover, as much as you're able to keep up with everything. Absolutely. So awesome. Um, Claudia asked, um, I have an Android and my child has an iPhone. Also, same problem here. Uh, what parental control app is available for me? So when you have that Android to iPhone. Yeah. Situation. So Bark, yeah, Bark will work on both. Um, okay. And then 
you know, if your child has an iPhone, Apple has its own parental controls on there. So, and you can also mirror their phone, which is a, one of the ways that a lot of people like to keep track of everything. So that means whenever they get a, a text message, that message is mirrored onto your phone. So those are the kind of things that we recommend. Again, multiple ways of securing. And, and again, the, one of the things that my wife calls me the most hated person by teenagers in North Carolina. And that's because what I always say to parents is if they, if your children have a device, that is your device. That is not their device. You're the one paying for it. You're the one who is legally responsible. Therefore spot check that device. And, you know, I get a lot of pushback from parents who are just like, well, my child's privacy. And it's just like, you know what the, when we're talking about a matter of, of risk aversion, the, the risk of your child being mad at you for a supposed privacy violation is far less than your child being groomed online by a predator and not recognizing it because an adult mind isn't, you know, viewing that. So, um, yeah. So anyway, Bark will work for both and both have, you know, both have pretty decent internal controls, but again, nothing is, nothing is flawless. All right, we have about nine minutes left, but um, Claudia asks, how does she mirror the iPhone with her Android? So there's a there's a whole setup that you can go through and I can get you guys the link to distribute. It's a it's a little bit cumbersome um, to set it up. It is worth it. Um, so I I'll get you a link for that. I can shoot you guys like a, a YouTube video to distribute um, how to mirror it. It's really, really good um, way to keep track of everything for sure. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, this is Patricia. I, I just have a comment. Thank you for the information. Um, what you have said covered tonight is 100% true. And one of the biggest statistics where, where you talked about the gap, I agree, is even worse than what we know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's really, it is something where we don't recognize. And it's, you know, it's hard because we we're trying to go about our lives, right? We're doing our best, especially parents. And, you know, our kids are just being bombarded from every side. You know, we have their peers, we have school, you know, we have the world, we have technology, we have all of this stuff bombarding them. And our goal is not to make them ostracized, but it's just to equip them with the right kind of tools to learn how to recognize if stuff is going south and then create that conversation that's open with parents. So that if a child feels like something is going wrong, they feel completely safe going to their parent and saying, hey, this feels really weird. This guy is talking to me. Um, and I know like a lot of you were talking about Snapchat. I can see popping up. I do want to mention Snapchat was originally created as an app for husbands and wives to share explicit images. So that was the on their original paperwork. You can look it up. That's what it was created for. So that should tell you a little bit about Snapchat. Now, Snapchat is one of those ones where I would I would delete that in a heartbeat from the world. Snapchat and TikTok, I would delete them in a heartbeat. Um, I wouldn't even think twice about it because they are the, some of the main offenders when it comes to uh, grooming online. So um, if you do have any questions about apps, I would sit down with your kid's phone and, and literally Google the apps that are on there. And you'll get a you'll get a pretty good uh, wake up call. Things like Discord, you know, uh, increasingly dangerous, um, you know, vault apps, which are hiding materials, things like that. Um, definitely, you know, during your spot check, sit down and check all of those apps. If you don't recognize them, Google them and you'll you'll see what they're about. So. Awesome. Uh, while we are finishing up with our questions, we would like you guys to just take um, one or two minutes to do a quick poll for us just to kind of measure the impact of this survey, um, uh, this workshop, I'm sorry, just a quick survey to measure the impact that this workshop had on you and your family and um, help us to um, plan future workshops as well. So if you guys could just take one or two minutes uh, to answer those questions in front of you right now, um, that would be very helpful. And um, as we do this, you can continue to ask questions or post them in the chat. That's awesome. I'm glad some of you already have tech contracts with your kids. So of those things that people don't realize, it's 
it's like, no, you're, you're telling your children, I take this responsibility very seriously in the same way. I'm not going to throw my car keys at you and be like, go get on the highway. I'm not going to give you a device without an agreement in place, without training and education in place. And so, um, so Dana, yeah. So the Southern border thing has created extra cases for us. Absolutely. Um, you know, we've been working with, uh, we had some heartbreaking cases related to the Southern border that is kind of, you know, crossing over into everything that we're doing right now. Um, but yeah, router protection, Charles, definitely a great thing to do. Um, you know, Brooklyn mentioned keeping the kids busy. That's that's what we do. That's that's what you know. It's just the art of distraction. Right? Kids kids are easily distracted, and you just you use that to get them into something that's fun. But that means that we have to be the ones setting the example, and that's often pretty difficult. You know, because we're at the end of the day we're exhausted. We want to sit down and watch Netflix. We want our kids to be on an iPad. We want peace and quiet. And so I understand yeah. that I have kids. So <laughs> so it is difficult. Um, but you know, it's worth it for them to, um, you know, to get them away from that internet as much as possible. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I question. And I think Nathiel had her okay. hand raised. I wanted to give her an opportunity. And then if anyone else has any questions, um, Simon shared his contact info and um, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer your questions if you reach out. Absolutely. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Simon. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I have a quick question. Like I missed the first 10 minutes and since it's being recorded, I would like to know if I can share this with some of my friends that they have kids as well, because the content is like awesome. What you share mm -hmm. of, and all these apps that we can uh, share with uh, as much people as I can, like it would be great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Again, our our hope and our we make all of our resources available. Um, share this as much as you can. Uh, if you want to get a group of your friends together and do a Zoom, my wife and I. My wife would normally be here. She has a pinched nerve in her neck, so she's she, she can't really sit up. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, if you want to get a group of moms together, do a Zoom. Again, our our vision and our hope is that you know, again, we operate safe houses. We want those safe houses empty. And so for us, our passion is getting to these young, vulnerable populations early enough so that they never have to encounter us on the street or in one of our safe houses. So any information that we have, we make it available for you guys. We want it to be we want to be a resource for you. So, again, if you don't have the website, it's the lantern dot net. Uh, you can go on there, hit the contact, uh, reach out to any of us. We'll make everything available. We'll guide you through. And I'll also shoot some links over um, to Crystal and Jamie so that they can distribute it to, to everyone just to give you some more information should you need it, so. Awesome, thank you so much. No thank problem. you guys so much. Those are all excellent questions that you guys asked and thank you guys for um, completing that poll for us. Uh, we will also send a follow-up email tomorrow with additional resources that you can utilize. Um, and we just thank you guys all so much for taking the time to Join us tonight for this Changemaker Workshop. We hope it had an impact on you and your families and hopefully um, can help us to educate and prevent um, against things like this from happening to our kids and the kids of people that we know. Um, we just want to thank you again, Simon, from the Lantern Project for your generous gift of sharing your time and your passion. And just thank you guys all so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you guys at the next one. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye.